Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Votero Coffee Talk on filling the gaps in data security and threat prevention. I am here with Evan, that is co-hosting with me, and we'll give everyone a minute to join, and we'll get started in a second. So grab your favorite coffee. Mine's an espresso, a double espresso, actually. No sugar, please. So I'll give you a minute to grab a, uh, your favorite drink and we'll get started shortly. In the meantime, I will tell you that I apologize up front if my Labradoodle mini dog goes nuts, which she usually does. Okay, and I think we're set up and we're ready to go. So let's kick it off and talk about an interesting aspect of how data security and threat prevention are actually very closely uh, related and tied together. So one of the things that we keep finding when we talk to customers and prospects at Votero um, is that when you think about threat prevention, when you think about where does risk enter your organization? And then you ask yourself the next question, which is what is the best way to actually protect your organization, your network, your endpoints, your, your cloud applications? Um, what's the best way of protecting them when you don't really have an absolute control like we had in the good old days on your network and endpoints, which are probably managed by someone else, right? Your network is no, no longer behind the firewall. It's no longer within your own data center. So the answer to that question, at least for the past you know, few decades, was centered on, on identity. Um, identity is the new perimeter. We've all heard that. Um, if you can secure identity and if you can secure access to environments and applications, then you should be good to go. While that still remains true, there's a deeper level of, of protection that needs to be put in place for many different reasons, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes. But a new perimeter is being defined, which is now not no longer the identity or the, the, the digital identity and what it has access to, but actually even deeper, the data itself. And what can be done with data? And is that data safe? And does it follow the privacy and compliance and regulations we need to follow as a company? Because our end goal with most cybersecurity uh, platforms is to keep data safe and keep data from being exfiltrated and keep data from being manipulated in malicious ways that can, uh, that can infect different parts within your network. So when we talk about data, let's talk about a few interesting facts. Because I think this is one of the um, one of the blind spots that we have within uh, many organizations, which is we look at data and we think about data risks and we bundle many different things together into that same package. So we're going to play a game, which is I call it guess where the risk is, and I've given you a few hints and we're going to dive a bit deeper into where the risk is. So a few facts, interesting facts. Um, IDC is saying that by 2025, right, just two years down the road, maybe a year and a half down the road, enterprise data will be in the realm of 175 zettabytes. That, that's just a mind-blowing amount of bits uh, flying around the, the ether, right? Enormous amount of data. But the interesting facts, without actually just saying a big number and trying to sound impressive, the really interesting fact is that 80% of that data is unstructured. And this is where our conversation starts. Because yes, there are many different attack vectors and risks for, uh, to an enterprise within structured data, but unstructured data, in most cases, what that means is files. That's where most of the data is. And frequently, that's where most um, breaches start. So 
Two additional interesting um, points to consider. Gartner is saying that in two years from now, 75% of that data will be created in the cloud. So it's no, no longer created on your endpoint within your network. It's created in the cloud, in a cloud application, um, in, in a cloud environment. And IDC is saying that nearly half of the data will actually also reside in the cloud. Now, what that means is that you no longer are creating data in the cloud. You're also using it in the cloud, not always on your endpoints. So in a few seconds, we're going to take a deeper look into what that actually means and what risks that introduces. So we think about unstructured data. Let's play the game, right? Where's the risk? So we think about unstructured data, we think about files. Where are files? They come in through emails. They're downloaded from websites. They're being archived. They're sent into Salesforce, CRMs. They fly through remote browser isolation environments, right? They're shared through file shares and cloud storages. Files and unstructured data is everywhere. It is amazing how files have become the that lifeblood of the digital business any digital transformation project involves movement of unstructured data between different environments and that's kind of scary it's kind of scary because of a few interesting things i'm going to show you in a second it's kind of scary because every one of those unstructured data bits those files can carry malicious payload so let's talk about a tale of two cities, London um, and Paris, right? Uh, for those of you that read the book. So um, when we talk about the tale of two cities, we're really talking about two different worlds colliding. And we'll get to why they're colliding later on. But I'd like to start by introducing the notion of threat prevention versus data security. And the question usually that I would you know, pose to anyone within the cyberspace, CISOs, um, IT security directors, uh, et cetera, is the first one is how are you protecting your business from malicious content and files? And the answer to that usually traditionally comes in the form of, hey, you know, we have an antivirus deployed. And why, when we realize that antivirus is not enough, and we'll talk about that as well, we brought in a sandbox because we, we don't want only to detect known bad. We also want to, to run different types of analysis on files as they're being executed in a safe environment. Well, the downside of that is what, what we all know. If I'm a user waiting for my file and my file is being exploded in a safe environment, what that really means is that I don't have the file. So if I don't have the file, I can't do my job because I need that file to do my job. So more and more sophistication was uh, was brought into this into, into the threat prevention environment with uh, endpoint detection and response, with managed detection and response, and with XDR technologies. And that, that, that environment is evolving as we move along. However, there's one thing we need to know about detection and response platforms. Usually detection and response platforms in most cases will detect. What that means is that they will try to find known patterns. They will try to find known signatures or known behaviors of files and based on that determine whether they're safe um, or not. Unfortunately, that's not good enough. It is an important piece of the puzzle for sure. It is not good enough. And when we talk about zero day, attacks, we will see that most attacks that are successful actually come in from the unknown type of uh, threats, the unknown type of attacks. And those are the ones that we sometimes find it more difficult to actually mitigate. Um, the same exact story can be told about data protection. If you track Gartner's uh, hype cycle for data protection, you'll see many, many, many different technology in the, in, uh, technologies in that space from data classification and discovery and DLP capabilities, um, encryption being put in place by, by data security platforms. There's something missing there once again, which is how do you address that unstructured data as it flies throughout your network? How do you dig deep into that unstructured data and dismantle it and disarm it from privacy-related threats and compliance-related threats. 
And this is where I'm starting to see this very interesting inter intersection of the content within unstructured data. How do we keep it safe? Safe from threats, safe from compliance and privacy risks. Um, before we move on, Evan, I, I, you know me, I can keep going. Do, uh, do we have questions on the chat, which I'm not seeing? Uh, yes, we actually just got one um, around uh, DSPM, so data security posture management. And we've heard mm -hmm. it's effective to identify the risks in data security. Um, yeah, is it truly effective in you know, identifying these privacy and compliance risks for unstructured data? Um, and is any other remediation needed uh, in addition to the new DSPM tech that's out there? Yeah, so no, I, I think the question is perfect because it hits exactly on the problem, right? If you look at, I think if we look into the data security hype cycle, DSPM is showing up somewhere there as an emerging technology, right? And it's the market is now super hyped about data security posture management, and for a good reason, right? We want to we want to evaluate, classify, and understand the data posture that we have as a company. Where do we store? Where do we keep data? Is it safe from a privacy compliance uh, perspective? Where is it moving? What is it allowed to do versus what not? That is very much focused on posture. It's a usually a one-time thing you do, right? You posture yourself, you figure out where you have gaps, and then you go and you try to figure out how to remediate. And the gap, as I think the question pointed out, was in remediation. So now that we know where the problem lies, now we have a new set of problems to deal with. How do we how do we tackle that? How do we how do we enforce policies? How do we how do we mitigate the problems that we've just found? And luckily, there are ways to do that. Uh, we will touch on that in a few seconds, but that's that's a that's a great question. So, and having said that, if anyone in the audience is now deploying DSPM or has been running for a while with DSPM, my challenge to you is look into the data you found and 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 let's talk later about what ways you found to to actually mitigate and enforce the challenges that you found. If if you have great ideas, please um, share them over the chat. I'm sure that the rest of the audience would be happy to hear from you. I do want to, to divert for a moment and talk about something that is very close to my heart, which is zero trust. Um, and the reason I want to do that, we're, we're going to do a very, very quick high level overview of an interesting topic. And we will definitely dive into that in much, much more detail in further sessions. So why am I even talking about zero trust when we talk about data security and when we talk about threat prevention, right? You think about uh, zero trust in the context of identity protection, of access management, right? And if you if you kind of take a look at that left-hand side of the, of the chart, companies have evolved from that castle and moat uh, approach, which is, hey, everything we have is within our network, in the data center, in our enterprise, it's locked behind the door, and it's all safe there, and we, we can easily control access to it. And if there's anyone traveling, yeah, we'll give them access through VPN. The technology has evolved. Um, cloud environments, digital migrations have forced us to understand that data doesn't reside anymore within the data center, within the enterprise. So zero trust, as it was originally defined, was very much focused on we can't trust, trust anyone anymore by definition, right? The implicit trust is no longer a thing. It's, that's a bad idea. And as we move deeper into what zero trust really is all about, it was initially all about trust no one by definition, give only granular access so you can't log in through a VPN and get access to the entire environment, that's a, that's a bad idea. You really want to control access very granularly. And you will grant access only when someone has strongly authenticated, someone has proven who they are um, in, a, in a reasonable manner. Um, and we can go deeper and deeper and deeper. But have we ever thought about that same exact idea in the context of data? 
in the context of data protection, in the context of threat prevention, not in the context of giving access to data, but have we really thought about why are we trusting files to come in through email and be pushed over Slack? And yeah, we do have technologies that somewhat mitigate some of that, but what do, what do these technologies do in most cases? They look at files as they come in through the network, right? An antivirus, a sandbox is being put in place to basically look at all traffic coming in into our network. Challenge is that that malicious file, that malicious content, which started somewhere, will end up in a thousand other areas. And we will get to that in a second. But the basic idea, and this is kind of my, my, my new mindset in the zero trust space is, we need to think about data protection and threat prevention in a very similar manner that we did for now 20 years on identity protection. So number one would be trust no file. Any file is should be considered malicious and should be dealt with as if it is malicious. Secure content everywhere. So do not rely only on securing files coming in through the network. A malicious content can be created within an endpoint, within the enterprise network. And from there, an attack, an attack can start as well, right? Insider-based attacks and even more sophisticated APT-based attacks. Sanitize, don't suspect. Don't assume that something might be suspicious and hence we can let it land on an endpoint and just then try to see what happens with it. How does it behave? We need to deal proactively with these problems as they come into, into our network. And in terms of being very granular on, on, uh, on, on what we allow, we should start thinking about, well, if a file came in through email, should we really allow that file to also be slacked over to someone or pushed into Salesforce? In some cases, of course, yes. That is what, that is what fuels the digital business. But in some cases, we need to be a bit more intelligent on what we allow and what we don't. And here's where I want to start talking about the gaps. Think about three different environments. And I've been seeing this from prospects and customers. And you know, the companies we work with at Votero keep asking us that same exact question if we circle back to the beginning of the session. And that question is, hey, we think we've dealt with email security. We have an email security gateway and you know, and we're, we're, we're implementing phishing prevention and all of that's good. But where, I mean, where else can files enter my enterprise? Where are my blind spots where I can, I can be exposed in a way that I don't have technology to help me resolve those problems? And I chose here one out of 10 interesting examples uh, you know, we could talk about many, many more use cases, but one specific example with three personas to describe what I mean. And these three personas will be external individuals, not an employee within my company, right? So let's think about a candidate. On the left-hand side, you're seeing a candidate sending in a resume, pushing it into a, into a, into a portal or into, you know, a, a website. And by doing that, what happens behind the scenes is that through APIs, that file is being pushed into um, an HR platform, like you know, Workday or ADP or Bamboo or you know, name your favorite HR application. If me as a human resources individual, if I need to do my job, I need immediate access to these resume files. I don't only need access to them, I need to send them over to other uh, peers within the company. That is one entry point um, for malicious content. The same story could be told on uh, purchase orders, right? So you, you're working with a partner, right? Your resale partner, your contractor, um, a vendor you work with is uploading a purchase order through a customer facing or partner facing portal. That will find its way into, uh, into Salesforce. Maybe a support ticket will find its way into ServiceNow. That will then be emailed to someone. That will then be Slack to someone. That content could be malicious. Once again, coming in from the outside. 
the, the same exact story. And this is actually, I can give an example of a real uh, real life case that we have we've dealt with, which is let's say you work with a third party contractor for legal purposes, legal um, legal firm, they help you with contracts, they send you contracts, you know, day in and day out on on many different agreements for SLAs and for um, different uh, collaboration agreements. So what happens is that document, which could be weaponized, then lands either uh, comes in through Dropbox or mail or, uh, you know, an external facing Slack channel. We've seen cases where that third party sharing that document didn't even know that the template being used to create a contract is weaponized. In a moment, we'll talk about what weaponized means. But assuming that that document was weaponized, you're receiving it, you're a member of the legal team, you need to do your job, you're going to, you're going to use that file. Just like a salesperson would be using a purchase order or an HR person um, using a resume. That is needed to do your job. Once you start using that file, you want to have immediate access to it and you want it to be fully functional. And the challenge becomes, how do we trust these external files coming in and make them safe? So that's where we see a huge, an enormous gap where files coming in are, are not truly uh, sanitized or, or dealt with in a manner that provides sufficient uh, security. So how does a breach work? I'm going to give one example. Uh, you probably may have heard about Casbanero, um, you know, one of the latest uh, Trojan malware uh, softwares that have been uh, deployed in the wild. Initially, this was targeting, so this is mainly targeting financial institutions, initially in Latin America, although we're seeing a whole lot of signs lately that Casbanero is actually moving laterally, so to say, throughout the globe into other regions as well. Um, and the intention is basically to, to exfiltrate um, financial information that can be used, obviously, for, uh, uh, for what hackers usually want to go after, which is your money. So how does this work? Let's talk about the, the mechanics. And again, I'm, I'm going to very skip through this quickly in high level. Talk to us later. We can go into much more detail on how, how this type of attack works. Usually, it starts with a phishing attack. Now, there's a very wrong perception on how to defend against a phishing attack. There are many different ways, right? But we should never assume that identifying a phishing attempt and flagging that to the user is the only layer of security that we should put in place for multiple reasons. The first one is that not all attempts are caught by phishing identifying technologies. The second one is that even if a phishing, a phishing attempt has been identified, the user doesn't always react appropriately to that. Back to what we talked about earlier, if I'm an HR person and I'm receiving a resume, I wouldn't even think twice. I would open that resume. I'm doing my job. So. A phishing attempt is really kind of how an attack starts with Casbanero, but what really happens is that that phishing attack includes within it either a malicious file, in most cases a zipped archive file, or a link to a zipped archive file which would be downloaded onto your endpoint. Now, here's a tip. If any of you believe on this call that you are safe from attacks coming in, try sending from your personal account a zipped file, which includes something weaponized. We can show you how to do that. That's fairly easy. Zip it, encrypt it, send it in, and check if your antivirus or sandbox catch that. I guarantee that won't happen. We do that on every single sales call that we, you know, on every single customer meeting, just to, to show the vulnerability. That zipped archive will fly through your antivirus as if it was benign and good to be used. You will double click on it and it will explode on your endpoint. And when that happens, that's where the attack starts because that malicious content is then 
implanted into your um, into your into your endpoint, um, stores itself with many different techniques of avoiding being wiped out on you know on a restart. And that's where that's where the adversary basically gained access to your system and can start moving laterally, um, escalating privileges and moving through your network and later on infecting more and more endpoint. I want to take a step back. Identity-based attacks focus on grabbing your credentials, which is what phishing was initially all about. That same technique can be done with sending you a malicious payload, either through attaching that to that message or through pointing you to a malicious link that would download that message, which will then be used to download malicious content on your endpoint, which will then be used to a screen grab or a key log and grab your credentials so those could be used for a sophisticated attack. I'll pause there just for a moment again. Um, Evan, any any anything I'm missing on on questions or comments or ideas? Uh, so uh, we got one here to the hosts. Um, can you just go back through? You know, why isn't a solution like uh, you know antivirus, sandbox, or you know endpoint um, technologies are why aren't they enough to detect an attack like this? Okay, so. Let's, so let's start with antivirus, because I think that's the easier one. So an antivirus is designed to detect either a known signature of a file that's known to be malicious, or if you think about next-gen antivirus, they also look into behaviors, right, into, into what a file actually does. There are two issues here. The first one is that unknown attacks, zero-day attacks, do not have a known signature. Even variants of known attacks, variants of files that contain uh, known attacks will not carry a known signature. And those cannot be detected. So those would not be blocked by an antivirus. Um, if you think about behaviors, new forms of threats can plant themselves and wait for months over months before they activate and detonate. So sandboxing a such, such, such a threat could be ineffective in many different ways. Um, but if you think about the sandbox, there's a second problem with sandboxing a, a you know a, a document or a an image that you're supposed to receive to do your job, which is the user doesn't get their content, right? The the employee that needs to do their job now has to go back to IT and request that file because that file was actually quarantined or blocked and hey, now analyze that file and, and release that. And it does two things. It, it makes the user very ineffective in doing their job. And it wastes a whole lot of time from security analysts in the SOC, just analyzing and releases the, releasing these files um, and then threat hunting where else did they land, right? So I think antivirus and sandbox are important. They do not solve the problem of the unknown attack uh, types that we're seeing grow significantly in the past few years in the market. I, I hope that answered the question. Um, I like talking about the journey of a file because we tend to think about file security, content security from the aspect of, hey, it came in, I need to make it safe, done, I'm done. It's safe, I'm good, I can sleep well. That's not really the case. Uh, if we think about that, if we go back to that resume coming in from a candidate, right? It's that resume itself can carry malicious content. I mean, imagine how many folks out there are building resumes with publicly available tools. What makes us think that many of these publicly available tools don't have weaponized, uh, weaponized templates, right? Or what makes us think that some of the some of those are not intentionally weaponizing documents, right? That infected uh, resume, which comes in through Workday, lands uh, with the HR person, is then sent over email to the hiring manager, maybe slacked onto you know, another hiring manager, someone else in the interview process, maybe placed in box in a repository of, of um, interviews uh, and candidates. That bug 
will land everywhere. That virus, that malware, that Trojan will land everywhere. Dealing with the with with the file when it comes in is one thing. Dealing with everywhere it lands is a whole different a whole different art. I want to bring this all together because we talked a lot about threat and we didn't touch yet um, about about uh, data protection and privacy and compliance. We're seeing two markets collide. The, th the threat market, which is now realizing the gaps it has in preventing threats within unstructured data. Remember that 80% we just talked about, the 80% of those hundreds of zettabytes of information, 80% of that is unstructured. Threat prevention is now moving more and more into looking into how do we solve this problem, but how do we solve it for the unknown type of attacks, for the zero day attacks? How do we solve that in real time? How do we not run on and, and analyze a file after it's landed in, and after it did damage? How do we analyze it in real time as it flies through our uh, virtual network, right? And through our, our the cosmos and the universe of our content. The same exact problem applies in the data privacy um, realm. Yes, we can encrypt files. They will still include um, sensitive data in them. And when that file is being exposed and read, that data will be uh, available for users to, to explore. Data security posture is focused on finding the problems, pointing out the problems. The same exact problem we pointed out in threat prevention applies in exactly the same way in data protection. Sensitive data exists within um, unstructured data, and that sensitive data should be dealt with in real time. So if you think about how we dealt with it in the past, DLP type techniques, you'd be running on a repository of data, cleansing it, figuring out whether it includes PII, PHI, PCI. That's not good enough anymore. Our data is now everywhere. Go back to zero trust. Our data is now on premise and in the cloud and in SaaS applications and flying through file transfers and uploaded into portals. Any one of those touch points can include privacy related data. We don't want to only know where the problem is. We want to resolve the problem and we want to do that proactively. So a, um, what Votero is doing in that space is basically redefining a whole new market category, which we're coining unified content security. And within that space, we're bringing together threat prevention and data security to address both threats within unstructured data. How we're doing that? We're doing that with zero trust content security, with zero trust concepts. We're doing that in real time as files move across, you know, uh, between different environments. And we're putting a whole lot of focus and effort into making it AI driven so that risk can be dealt with efficiently and that intelligence can be provided and analytics can be provided to you in the SOC so you can take action in, in, in a much quicker, uh, in much quicker way. So summarizing quickly, if we hold back files, if we don't allow them to fulfill what they need to do, which is land with a person that needs to use them, right? If we hold them back as we've done in the past, we're holding back digital transformation. We're holding back the business from actually operating. Votero's vision is to let files fly free through your virtual networks, through your applications, make them safe proactively wherever they are. That is the problem we're trying to solve for three reasons. Making our customers safe, basically reducing a whole lot of work within the SOC and, and IT admins and analysts that spend hours and days in analyzing threats and files. We can, we can help prevent that proactively and let the SOC teams focus on what truly matters. And making the business efficient and, and effective by allowing the free flow of, of files. And I think with that, we, we just dipped our toe into kind of that bringing together of these two markets. We can talk about that for hours. I'd be more than happy to, um, to, to chat after the session with, you know, with anyone on uh, that has joined. I, I want to say thanks for, you know, thanks for joining and spending. I, I hope your coffee was great. 
Um, Evan, do we have any closing comments or um, or ideas? Uh, nothing since the last question. Perfect. I did see a note earlier on the on one of the chat asking how do we prevent zero day attacks. I we can definitely go into that. We can take that offline. There is a whole um, art behind how how files can be sanitized to prevent zero day attacks, even the ones we don't know. So happy to chat about that offline. And thanks for joining everybody. See you next time.